meetup. Uh, I don't know if you were at the first meetup that we did back in November, was it? Uh, so that was fun. We did a little meet and greet, got to know each other. There's some really cool things going on in this room at your own houses. And everything from goats to rabbits to aquaponics to gardens to vertical gardens to uh, sensors and science and technology. And just learning about refrigeration through solar power. Today I want to give most of our time to Christina and everyone here because she's an amazing resource that I met through Slow Money. Uh, which is a really cool group if you're not familiar with them, where they are getting investors to invest in local foods uh, and also finding entrepreneurs that need investments. I'm not ready for that yet. They want people that are already, they want businesses that are churning away a little bit, right, that are looking to go to the next level. So these are really cool meetings as well, the Slow Money, uh, if you're interested in. Slow Money. The word. The, like the third Monday, right? Every month. Cool. So Christina is from the Sustainable Law, Sustainable Economy Law Group in Berkeley, and she and her group are part of the implementation of the new homemade food laws for California, and uh, also has some questions because their group is producing policies to help people who are growing food at home. And I'll share that. With you. So. I'm uh, really excited that you're all here today, and it'd be great if we could just get to know each other really quickly before we jump in, and then we'll give it off to Christina for an hour, hour and a half, or you know, however long it needs to go. Like Sundown said, I'm Christina. Um, I work full time for a nonprofit. We're based in Berkeley slash Oakland, um, called the Sustainable Economy Law Center. Um, and most of the people who work for the organization. Um, provide legal resources to um, help people navigate existing laws who are trying to do right for their local communities and the environment by creating new forms of social enterprise that facilitate more um, sharing of resources um, and more uh, economic resilience. So you know, we like to support things like small home-based or neighborhood-based enterprises that provide for people and make people less reliant on really enormous national or multinational corporations that are owned by people who are far away and have no um, interest or investment. So, um, yeah, we provide a lot of written legal resources. My role is, um, is the organization's policy director, so when we decide that the laws are just so restrictive that we want to change them, that's generally when I get involved. So. Um, up until now, I've been doing a lot of food-related stuff. We also are starting to get more and more involved in the co-op movement, and, and this, this next year, I'm probably going to be working on some laws related to just like making life easier and paving the way for the development of more co-ops, whether that's housing co-op or worker-owned um, businesses and other kinds of co-ops. Um, we've done work around uh, crowdfunding and basically a lot of kind of paving the way for businesses to be um, funded by a larger group of non-wealthy investors instead of reliant on venture capitalists or angel investors uh, or other like uh, basically like really big sources of money that is like, like far away and it is for a lot of um, small businesses. So that's, that's kind of a just like a taste of the kind of work that we do. Um, I'm not a lawyer so I can't give legal advice. Um, this coming year and, and really create reputable feedback and 
talk about that proposal that's still very much in draft form and still very um, malleable and, and open to, to change. Um, but I had, um, before I get started on what we see that, I'm just wondering how much background, if any, people might already have if not talking about the word. Super feature. Does anyone kind of learn about the Hemingway Foodak already? Our website, your local health department, or anything like that? I read that in the news. Okay. Cool. Um, so I'll just kind of give like an overview of it, and we'll see how many questions there are, and we'll see how much time we want to spend on that. Um, maybe if we have like an hour and a half, roughly. If we need more, yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, maybe we can spend like 45 minutes or not, 45 minutes on the neighborhood we can do it flexible, longer than you will need it. I think that's going to be like a new thing to move on to the next topic at some point. So the homemade food act, um, prior to the homemade food act in California, it was pretty much illegal to sell any homemade food product. There was just a narrow exemption for like one-time events put on by churches non-profit charity groups um, that, you know, wanted to use like a one-term event a few times per year, and even then it left a lot of discretion up to local county departments of environmental health to decide like what they were going to allow, if they were going to allow it, what the fees and everything that that would be, um, but to run a home-based food business out of your home was, was um, totally illegal in California, but new our organization and lots of other people were aware that lots of people were doing that anyway and lots of people would like to be doing that but weren't doing it because it's illegal so we proposed um the california homemade food act based on similar laws and now like 33 or 34 other states across the country um at the time there weren't quite that many laws it's kind of a big trend now where off of cottage laws um around the united States just create an exemption to those um, uh, state health and safety laws for um, home-based food businesses that are just making non-intentionally hazardous foods. Um, non-intentionally hazardous is kind of an imperfect legal term. I've actually talked to a few safety scientists at UC Davis who told me, like, it's kind of an outdated term and it kind of overgeneralizes, but that's, that's sort of a big term for the um, health and safety law regulators at um, the health department in terms of deciding like, whether things need to be refrigerated or not. Um, so we sort of went off of what, what California was already in California law and within the laws of most other states is this kind of distinction between potentially hazardous and not potentially hazardous foods. So potentially hazardous foods can now be made in a home kitchen if you meet certain um, requirements or, or kind of abide by certain restrictions on the chicken and meat. Through the local health department, not you may need an actual inspection from your local health department to kind of the nature of your sales. But so the kinds of foods that you're allowed to make, there's a specific list of foods. You can find it on the California Department of Public Health's website. You can find it on my organization's website. Your local county Department of Environmental Health should have it on their website. All of my understanding is that some counties are kind of dragging their feet. Prescriptive and they're too specific, and they leave out 
um, a few things. Um, like they don't include marmalade, which are like totally fake because <laughs> they're like really high acid. Um, and they also generally um, require a higher ratio of sugar to a fruit than we think is necessary for, for safety reasons. Like most, um, yeah, like, you know, there's a lot of like objective um, ways of determining what what meets the definition of non potentially hazardous and it doesn't necessarily have a lot of sugar in it. So that's something we're gonna do some advocacy around to try and change that part of the list so that it's more open ended. So we yeah, for now your jams, jelly and other things are supposed to meet these special definitions of all those terms, although I doubt the local health department are gonna really carefully enforce that or anything like that. Like just Um, you can have. Generally, we're, um, our 
interpretation of the law is that scale should be restricted to within the state of California because um, once you're crossing state lines, then it becomes interstate commerce and then the federal government can regulate the activities and we're still just trying to, to assess like how feasible it would be for someone to try and sell cottage food products across state lines, but our understanding is that it would either be illegal or it would be a lot more complicated. So um, we're telling everyone in California is it's right to do your sales. And depending on your method of sales, there are potentially additional geographic restrictions. Um, your city zoning or planning department can't stop you from having a cottage food operation in your home, but they could require you to get something like a conditional use permit. Um, and so there may be a fee for that, or it may just be automatically permitted. Um, you may not need to even talk to them or get anything from your city or, or zoning department, or your city planning or zoning department, or your county planning department. Um, but that you know, that can vary from place to place, so um, you'll want to check in with them before starting. Um, there are um, a bunch of things that need to be on your on your label, there, you know, the name of your, your product, um, um, the name of your, your business, and a list of ingredients. Um, and they need to be in order of predominance by state, so like the first ingredient needs to be like the main ingredient or what there's of by state and then going into testing order. Um, if you if your product includes any of the like common allergens like meat, dairy, um, soy, or any kind of tree nut, you in addition to the ingredient statement, there needs to be a separate statement just saying like this product contains almonds, this product contains wheat or um, whatever that um, allergen is. Um, You'll have to have just a statement that says this is made at Ellen Kitchen on the label. And when you register, get a permit from your county health department, which I'll talk about in a minute, they're going to give you like a unique serial number, which also needs to go on the label of your product for traceability on the off chance that something does go wrong and you need to be able to trace where the food product came from. Um, and then because of federal law, which we weren't really able to get around, Either the address of your home business needs to be on the label, or if your address is already in a local or like the main like phone book, like the yellow pages, or the um, standard phone book, then you don't have to put your specific address. You can just put the county where you um, are operating or where you got your permit from. But yeah, if you're not in the phone book, then, then your whole address needs to go on the label. Um, but the good part about the label is that you don't need to include a nutrition fact statement with like, you know, the number of, of, you know, grams of sugar and fat per serving and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about that. Um, that's it. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so like I said, you will have to check in with your county health department. Um, most places to county health department. There's a few places where the city has its own health department separate from the county. But in most cases, you'll go to your county department of environmental health, and um, you'll either get a Class A or a Class B um, permit from them. The Class A is for direct sales only. So if you're a cottage food producer or you're one employee or your household member, but like you, you know, someone working for your business is going to be selling directly to the consumer. <laughs> then you need just a class A registration. Um, and direct to the consumer can take place in a lot of different places. It could be at a farmer's market, it could be out of your home, it could be at a community event, you know, anywhere where you're selling directly to the consumer. That's a class A registration. And the health department will not inspect your kitchen unless they have a specific reason to believe that you're doing something illegal. Um, you just do like a self-certification checklist where you check off and sign a piece of paper that has a list of um, health and safe food handling practices that you need to commit to following and you just kind of self-certify yourself and send your paperwork into the health department. They'll collect a fee to keep your paperwork on file. Um, and yeah, they'll only ever want to come to your kitchen if they suspect you're doing something wrong. And you'll, you'll um, do that registration on an annual basis, um, both the cost day and cost a year, kind of once a year thing. The Class B um, process is similar. The same standards apply for safe food handling practices, like you need to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom or blow your nose or anything like that. 
use of sanitizer utensils. There's a whole bunch of kind of standard practices that are used in regular commercial kitchens, and you're expected to follow um, the same procedures um, for the most part. Um, yeah, you know, sanitizing your, your utensils and, and, and things that you use to handle the food, um, things like that. Um, they're all pretty reasonable. Um, but the difference with Class B is that someone from the health department will inspect your kitchen once a year, and then they have the right to inspect it additional times if they have a specific reason that they're doing something wrong, but generally it'll be once a year. So that Class B permit is more expensive because the health department actually wants to come in and inspect your kitchen. So those are the two options. Uh, with Class B, there's one more restriction in that you're restricted to um, indirect sales within the county. You can still do direct sales around the state, but indirect sales like through a, um, through a local shop or a restaurant that you're able to do with the Class B permit has to be like the shop or the restaurant or the third party that's selling your product has to be within your county or it can be in another county only if that other county specifically decided that they're going to allow indirect sales of products to your product. Other yeah, and not just for all class B, but like class B gives you the right to do both the direct consumer sales and the indirect sales to like a third party retailer. And it's just something like the sales through like a third party seller that are limited to the county or other counties that decide they're okay with cottage food products indirectly. And, and with the class A, you're not allowed to do the indirect sales? Yeah, you can only do direct to consumer oh. sales yourself. Yeah, you, if you want to do the indirect sales to like a local shop or restaurant, you have to get a class B permit and get those indirect sales to be much more geographically Did you just say if you sell to a restaurant? Mm -hmm. So if the restaurant's serving your food, that's an indirect mm -hmm. sale? Yeah, so generally you'll only be able to do that with restaurants that are in your county or if the restaurant you want to sell to happens to be within another county that is okay with um, indirect sales um, from other counties, you'll have to ask that county. I think only a few counties so far have decided that they're going to accept um, indirect sales of cottage food products from outside the county. I think Marin County decided they're okay with that. LA County decided they're okay, but only from like certain other nearby counties. So. I mean, I, I suspect that's what a lot of counties will do, is they'll say, okay, we're okay with it as long as it's like one of our neighboring counties. But I think they, the reason why the health officers really wanted this restriction, we sort of fought back, but this was kind of a, a compromise we ended up making to preserve the bill. I think they wanted to make sure that this wasn't kind of anyone localized and like small scale food systems and, you know, wasn't going to be utilized by like much bigger companies. You know, take advantage of the lower standards um, that are allowed for product and operation. So, Usually you'll, um, you'll, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to negotiate for like a time. They may give you like a window of time, you know, where it comes like some time on the day or something. So it's not like a it would only be like that if they were responding to like a complaint or like, you know, if they're taking advantage of their right to inspect because they think they're doing something wrong. But the routine, like, on their inspection, they'll usually like schedule something like that with you. They have a little bit of discretion, I think, and it might be different from county to county, but so far I haven't heard of anyone having trouble with like them wanting to come unannounced. Like, I think they'll self schedule something and just maybe for a Oh, I'm pretty sure you can't use like a pseudo box. I'm pretty sure it has to be the place of the business, which is where you're producing the same product. Like, I'm trying to think of some useful, like, what if you have an office somewhere else and you want to use that product? But when I was reading the federal law, like, it was really clear, like, it has to be the same book, like, where the business is, like, physically, like, producing yeah, weird. Yeah, honey is on the list of allowed foods. Um, are there any like that Not yet. Is anyone else here interested in keeping bees? You're interested in keeping bees? So, 
I've been learning a lot about honey production lately, and I think you can make an argument that if you want to do, um, so honey is a list of live food, so if you're getting the cottage food operation department and everything anyway, like, yeah, honey is totally on the list of live food. Um, that's not debated. I think you could even, if you just wanted to do honey, I think you could make an argument that you don't even need, like, a class A or a class C permit. You don't even need to comply with the cottage food rules if you're not processing your honey, like, if you're not doing to it besides just harvesting it and putting it in a jar, like, you're not pasteurizing it, you're not adding, like, you know, you're not infusing it with any, like, flavors or anything like that. I think so you can make those less I, I think you can make an argument for it, but the problem is that um, at, at both the state level and local county level, the um, health and safety regulators and the ag regulators disagree on whether honey is um, is like a processed food product that needs to be made in a commercial kitchen or whether it's a raw agricultural product that can just sort of be harvested and put in a container and then sold to the consumer without going through the commercial kitchen process. It seems like it's interpreted differently by different regulators, and there's like a total lack of consensus for how it should be regulated. Mm -hmm. a, a certified kitchen I put that out, and you have Oh, really? Okay. So, yeah, it is on the list of non potential hazardous foods in front of cottage food operations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the cottage food law in a nutshell. Are there any more questions? There was a tea nut recall, and you had used those tea nuts, are you lying? Um, yeah, like that's part of the reason why the health department wants to be involved and why, you know, even if they're not inspecting your kitchen, why they still, like, you know, have your information on file and why you need to put on your label that can be the serial number that they're going to give you because it is, if there is an illness outbreak, um, it is so that they can treat and recall it. Or, so do you have to keep track, like if you buy a keynote mm -hmm. and you put it in a big tool mm -hmm. and those keynotes were recalled, do you have to keep track of all the yeah. things you do? Yeah, okay. it, it doesn't say that in the letter of the law, them. but for liability purposes, I would just keep track of where you buy so everything. So then would from. I be liable for that if someone got sick from someone in the Oh, I, yeah, 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 I hear what you're saying. I can't give legal advice, so I don't want to say like, yes or no, you would or you would be liable, and, you know, it's hard for me to tell. But we um, recommend to anyone who's taking advantage of the law that they get product liability insurance just to cover you. I mean, my, you know, I can just guess, like, yeah, probably the company that, you know, released contaminated peanuts to the market, you know, probably should be held liable. Like, that's just makes common sense to me, but especially with food products, like, you never know, like, you know, when someone gets sick from something, it's, it's, you know, they often can't figure out right away, like, what the source was, so they'll want to go back to, like, everything that that person ate or might have eaten, you know, within a certain amount of time, I want to check in on, them, like, okay, like, what did this person eat, like, what were the ingredients of that, and where did that come from, like, some of these illness outbreaks, you know, tracing it back to the source can sometimes mean that. A lot of other people who are totally innocent sort of get like pulled into the process. So, um, so we're just and you know with food businesses or really with any other kind of businesses, we strongly recommend that you at least seriously consider product liability and general liability insurance. Um, just you know, just to save on the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah I would definitely recommend that. Uh, how about, like, bread dough? Bread dough? Yeah. That's a good question. I know you can make, you can sell, like, dry baking mixes that just have all the dry ingredients mm -hmm. in them, and then you can sell it to a consumer with instructions, like, add an egg or add water or milk or whatever, and then bake this in the oven. Um, I'm not sure about bread dough. Is that... Because it probably would have to be kept refrigerated if mm -hmm. it weren't used in a certain yeah. short period of time. Yeah. Frozen, so frozen refrigerated. Yeah, he's talking about like car baked, like rolls yeah. or that sort of thing where it's already been risen and it's frozen. Yeah, probably not because it's got a lot of moisture in it, but it hasn't been baked yet. So yeah, I don't, I don't okay. think that would be considered not potentially hazardous food unless you're just selling like the dry 
dry ingredients for baked goods. Yeah, you can do like dry baking treatment. Oh, and one other question. Uh, what do you need? Aside from the permit, the air permit, is it also necessary to get a permit? Uh, that varies from city to city, but most, um, most cities in the area that I've looked into do require a business license. So yeah, cottage food operation is a business, so like all the rules that apply to businesses apply to a cottage food business. You know, it's exempt from um, state level health and safety laws regarding like, you know, the commercial kitchen facilities, but it doesn't mean it's exempt from any other laws that apply to businesses, so like you're subject to, you know, tax. Um, that you have to pay on income from your business. I mean, most cities need you know, a business license. Um, all, of, all of those kinds of things will apply. So if you're doing trade of any of these things, you have a little money. Mm, that's a good question. Um, so generally, if you earn any income, even if it's not in U.S. dollars, but you're, you're earning income, your business is earning income in the form of like a product or, or anything but U.S. dollars, like generally like as far as taxes go, like that's still considered income and you're supposed to estimate the value of what you receive from your partner. Um, and unfortunately you have to pay taxes to the IRS in U.S. dollars for that. It's really good job. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's different I think if you're not if you're not running a business it's more like if your business is knowledgeable but I'm not an expert on barter law we actually have other people at uh, Excel who are really knowledgeable about um, you guys have a good video about that on your website there's a little animated video about oh. how bartering and how the states and the feds get interested in this yeah, exchange. Yeah, yeah. It's really like, yeah, I don't want to, if you're, if you and your neighbor are just trading produce, like most people probably wouldn't pay income tax on that, and I doubt the IRS would come in and, and get really concerned about you. But if you're like a business and you're like, you know, doing a lot of bartering, then you do want to keep record of that. And, what we're interested in doing uh, on the hardware stuff mm -hmm. is setting up like, a network to allow people to oh. trade, like specialize in just a couple plants mm -hmm. and then kind of trade those with people who have a surplus to the Yeah. So no money is actually uh -huh. transacted there. So I have Actually, yeah, you might, you might be a candidate for our like pilot legal services program. We do actually take on clients and provide legal advice to them. Um, that's like it was beyond my area of expertise, but we have now three people at our organization who are becoming really knowledgeable on barter and local currencies and all the like federal laws that apply and when they don't apply. Um, so yeah, I don't want to give you a straight yes or no, because unfortunately it's way more complicated. <laughs> it's just like the like Yeah, yeah, so I, um, can I ask how many other people are interested in this kind of concept? Because it's something I'm also interested in, and maybe we can just find some resources and do a whole other discussion around that. Yeah, maybe you can also talk to you about that. Or we do have, um, we do have a website that we're building. It doesn't have a lot of information on it yet. Um, it's called barterlaw.org. And it has pretty sure it's barterlaw.org. We haven't started like really like publicizing it in a widespread way because some of our staff are just like, there's some information on there, but they're in the process of putting up a lot more information on there. And it'll soon have like some guidelines on like when is like when is something subject to tax and when is it not subject to tax and kind of discussing the like murky territory um, there. So I would um, yeah check back with our general website is the sclc.org for sustainable economy law centers. Uh, we're soon going to link to barterlaw.org. I don't think we do yet. It's not. I'm not ready to start like publicizing it, but it's going to be a whole web resource to like help people with all those questions. And then, yeah, we may um, we may be willing to take on some individual clients who like have like really specific questions about their their business. Stuff. But yeah, there's um yeah, we have a, we have a couple. Are you guys familiar with the time bank? 
We're not as many. We were kind of, we know of them, we're like kind of friends with them, but we're not, yeah, we don't have any like official partnership or anything like that. Yeah, I remember of the time being. Yeah. Is it mostly in San Francisco? There, yeah, there's, there's some activity in the East Bay, definitely, but is it not really the Yeah, it's a really great resource. Do, yeah, does anyone else know about the Bay Area? I'm getting, it's Bay Area community. Right? Uh, I yeah, it's a really, it's a really fun resource. Um, I think there was a like Time Bank dot C A C E Yeah. But basically it's an exchange of mostly services. So like you can spend an hour doing something for another member of the Time Bank. Um, you know, you can do gardening for them or you can, you know, help them with their taxes or whatever your skills or or um, still, or you can spend an hour helping other members, and then you get an hour of credit that you can then spend on Massage another. Yeah, <laughs> all kinds of plumbing. Yeah, yeah. And it's hour for hour. It doesn't matter on, you know, out on the normal like capitalist market what your what your hour of your services are worth. It doesn't matter. It's timing is hour for hour. There's a lot of cool opportunities to. Other like minded people there and also maybe gain some services that you might not otherwise want to pay for. Yeah. Um, cool. Interesting topic in itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we actually, the Seattle Economy Law Center might be pushing forward um, a state law or a proposal to remove part of California state law that makes alternative currency is illegal because the prohibition in California state law about alternative currencies is super vague and like it doesn't really explain what an alternative currency is. Like if I use one of those Facebook apps where I'm like exchanging, you know, some like digital points but then I could trade those for US dollars, like that sounds like an alternative currency, but like everyone uses that all the time. No one's like cracking down on people using alternative currencies. But it's a super vague and like it's a law that's been in the state code. It was originally in the state constitution and then it got like moved over to some other kind of state code. And most other states don't have a law like that. That they like alternative currencies are illegal and it's like not really enforced. Like we're not aware of like the attorney general or any laws like cracking down on people. It was like Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin. I mean, looking at that law, like, if you could interpret it in a lot of different ways, you could interpret it to mean that, like, gift cards, you know, like, a gift certificate to a store is an alternative currency. So it's super, it's a really bad law, but, yeah, some, I know some sort of, like, barter exchange organizations have, like, gotten worried, like, wait a minute, are we an alternative currency? Like, are we illegal? Just, like, Facebook and Bitcoin. Starbucks gift cards and <laughs> a million other things that could be considered illegal. So yeah, we're trying to get it removed from the state code just so that no one has to worry about what it might apply to or not apply to. But, but yeah, it's not, they're not actively enforcing that, so don't get too scared about it. <laughs> it is in the law. We might be working on it. Um, so there, there is like um, a law that um, regulates um, Process being farm produced goods. How does that overlap with this law? Or this so there are um, there are lots about raw agricultural products that are harvested but not like processed. Um, processing. I thought there was an odd processing law. Not that I'm aware of. I think it would just relate to like, you know, if you're harvesting strawberries and you have like a, you know, you can use like a bucket to like peel the strawberries and then you know, transport the strawberries to like the farmer's market or wherever the produce distributor you're you're selling to. You. But um, I'm not aware of separate laws regarding like processing. Like if you grow it and you process it outside. Not. I'm not aware of the 
you know, have a way to, um, to take care of you already, but if they don't, they pretty much will have to next year because there's going to be a state law that sort of takes the more standard process. Yeah, that's a good question. And, yeah, I'm hoping your, your state health department will know, but I'm curious to know, like, if they, like, get to the police or take it to the hospital, if they actually help with yeah. They're really concerned that you weigh everything. Like you have to say a pound is a pound, and you have to get your scale certified by a weight measure. That's what they're mostly concerned about. It's very bizarre. Just that the weight is what it's going yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I forgot. I already have my own Oh, okay, you do yeah. have yeah. a place to put it on the box. But there are different rules if you're but selling But there's on-farm versus off-farm. Yeah, if you're yeah. selling it on-site, like out of your home, or if you're selling it at a certified farmer's market, I think there are, the, the rules are a little bit different. Well, if you're off-site, they really want it weighed. Mm-hmm. Like, and eggs, they want it sized. Like, no, I used to mix up all the eggs because people like that. I'll like it all these different sizes. No, you have to sell all the same size. And that's by weight. And you have to know what the weight is. And you can only sell. So I started selling half sizes instead of 12 so that I could get all the different sizes. It's <laughs> a smaller than half. Yeah. yeah. And you have to pay like a small fee for eggs, right? That's like a division of No, I have a number. But only the farmer's market, because I see for uh-huh. inspection every year. And you saw the farmer's market? I do, but if I didn't, I wouldn't have to see But I'm in the county. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think if you were selling not, I think it's the easiest if you're selling out of the farmer's market, because they have oh, a okay. big okay. farmer's market for right? small farmers to sell directly. But yeah, if you want to try something like this, like restaurants or corner stores, yeah, there are standards. Actually, the packages. No, the the weight applies to the farmers market. Oh really? It's actually harder to sell it. Really? Yeah. Okay. So there are standard packing requirements and things like that. Don't apply to farmers markets, but they do apply to any other. Well, I called someone and talked to them. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's something you'll be able to notice about the law is if you call different employment agencies and ask them questions, they'll sometimes give you your name. I've had this experience quite a bit. Like, they didn't pay for it. What? Did they pay for it? No, they didn't pay for it. There's no online version, there's no, <laughs> but you know, handling eggs is actually more complicated than people think. I can handle them, you know, make sure they are crap, mm-hmm. make sure you don't wash them in cold water, you know, there's all sorts of things you need to wash them, it's very complicated, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, I really appreciate it. Some of the eggs I get from the supermarket still have crap on them. Anyway, this is bad. Thank you again. So, you saw it first, right? Yeah. That's why I was like, oh, good. I'm just going to explain this to you. Yeah. You would think you could ask me to put them in the table. They don't. They have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them have like their jobs that are like very rare. Yeah. 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 Actually, actually, you have to find the code. Yeah. Yeah. So the the dairy question that you put dairy and baked goods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dairy and put in the baked goods. You need to figure out how to make your dairy an approved source because everything you use. They just haven't had to deal with it very much, and or the people who you know would need to become a fruit source in their county just don't know that they need to become a fruit source, and they're just selling 
animal products or fresh fruits and vegetables anyway. I think I think in most cases where you have these like small like home based um, you know, homestead operations that do sell some of their produce, they have, my guess is that in most cases they don't they don't bother to check in with the home department. No, so if you're selling a bakery, you have to have a rate on the store. If you're selling a bakery, like if you're advertising for one pound loaf of bread that I'm selling to, then you do have to um, pass the weed and you will want to get like, a certificate from um, weed competitors in the ag department. But if you're not selling it by weight, you're just there, I'm selling you the phone and like this is a phone and you're not like, advertising like the weed. So if you grow your own ingredients, then you have to become an approved source mm-hmm. through like the same stuff you're talking about with Yeah, the yeah. Okay. That's basically about as much as I can tell you, not knowing, not having actually talked to anyone. I, I have talked to someone at Santa Clara um, County Health Department, and she recommended calling the Ag Department, because sometimes the Health Department and the Ag Department in a county will have an agreement where like the Ag Department will be approved. Question, but I recommend starting with the health department because they can tell you what's up, and in state law, they're the ones who are supposed to enforce it. But yeah, sometimes they may send you over to the department. Oh, sure. Cool. So, you have any One last question. Yeah. That is, uh, at what point are sales doing to sales tax? Um, raising animals will be a lot more controversial and difficult to 
get past in the legislative process. So we need to have that out of the proposal for now, mostly as like a political kind of calculation. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of cities that have um, rules against, um, you know, what you can have in your front yard, especially. Um, so this would address that. And then kind of what to be more exciting as someone who wants to see the growth of more um, based enterprises and more sustainable food enterprises is that this law would also protect your right to grow fruits and vegetables um, and then be able to sell them and um, have that as a small business. Um, it would allow cities to put some restrictions on um, like how many customers you have coming to your home, you know, so the city could decide we don't want you to have more than X number of customers today or we don't want you to be selling having like a farm stand at your site at 11 o'clock at night with customers coming and going and, and things like that. They can um, they can restrict. Um, but yeah, you so it would kind of protect your right to grow food in your home, fruits and vegetables at least, um, and take them to a farmer's market for sale or sell them to a local restaurant. Assuming that this other legislation this year helps us clarify that approved sources They will, they will find you, they will find you. And it's not like um, neighbor complaint based. So like they actively go out and look for people who are violating a variety of front yard um, So you can do like raise beds and grass in the team or something? Like you need to maximize the amount of grass that you have. I guess in theory, yeah, as long as they decide that it's, yeah. you know, it's <laughs> grass or grass alternative. alternative, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So we're thinking about doing things like flaxseed in the front yard because they're beautiful. I mean, most people probably wouldn't realize that's a food source. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess the only thing I'd be concerned of with the whole food is like I noticed that um, sometimes people can use toxic things or there may be some pollution and oil up home or or people I know people who don't know the eggs can't labels at all and are you know, how how do you educate people so that they know oh I shouldn't be eating that is yeah. Um, the our proposal doesn't say anything specific about use of any kind of pesticides or herbicides in your yard. Um, my understanding is that a lot of people who have a, you know, grass lawn actually do use a lot of um, nasty chemicals in it and keep it clean. Um, so I'm hoping if they're going through that Thank 
education about what kinds of things to look for without the whole process of you actually stepping out in the factories to inspect the cars. And I think the fact that you can probably start crossing over into the territory of just like I think, you know, we can just check the Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure our identity is a vehicle for them. Yeah. I think it's too much. They want you to watch your you know, oh, yeah. and that's our identity. <laughs> oh yeah, there's 40 chemicals. Section 205 or 20 something, da da da. 41 chemicals that are approved for organic process. And not that you have to use it, but you can. And yeah, and so I, yeah, so I don't know if even organic it seems to have lost. A real purpose to it. The yeah. new one to me I heard was that they're saying they're like it's organic and available for transplants. So they're saying like strawberries, they're not available organically and to mass scale, so they can use methyl bromide strawberries. Um, and they're organic. You know, so a lot of people every year they buy their starts and then so there's some there's like one farmer that's actually doing it, but he was getting other farmers to sneak in a buy saying it's not available. So like you, you think there's no commercial producers uh, strawberry starts that are not pesticide free. So they're legally allowed to get these pesticide sprayed strawberries and call them organic. Well, and the animal manures are really good for farm animal manures, and they farm chickens with arsenic. Yeah. With arsenic compounds, so now rice, organic rice, there's arsenic in it. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, and do people know how to compost properly? That's another thing. Mm -hmm. You know, are, are they, yeah, in their... Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, some kind of educational resource that would be widely available. Could be school of uh, voluntary certification. Mm -hmm. I mean, a label or something that you can put on your homemade products or something. So, well, I mean, that's kind of the farm that I work at, which is a green string farm in Kalamazoo. It's off Canards, it's a long time beyond organic farm where you can do so. And he, like, he's originally been active, like, trying to get, like, change the system. And the whole thing, originally he said, we just wanted to not, they didn't want to call their food organic. They wanted to label their vegetable of what it was, tomato, tomato. If you have methyl bromide on your tomato, then you're going to put methyl bromide as an ingredient. And so that was their original fight. They just wanted to, whatever you use, put it on there, let the let the people decide. And that, they got nowhere with that. And then, you know, like, you can try to just label GMOs. You can't get that label. It's so, like this new thing is he's just training new farmers. Integrity. It's all about personal integrity. You know your farmer. And it's just got to go from that. I mean, these guys run pretty much Monsanto, maybe oh, all these sorry. chemicals. They're up so high. And, all, all of the governments were a lot. Pretty scary. So, Christina, what is it that, that the uh, approved sources process is not doing to that one person to push this policy? Um, it's, it's just really hard to figure out like, what, like, how do I become an approved source? And just the process is different from county to county, and I think there's a lot of desire for kind of a more uniform set of rules to be followed um, across the state for determining what an approved source is. But it doesn't it doesn't go into any of the questions of like you know where I, I guess if you are using if you are using supplies, I think that might be more regulated, but it doesn't go into any of these questions of like, is your neighbor using pesticides, you know, or, you know, are you washing your car right next to your, um, right next to your vegetable garden, or do you have, you know, lead in your soil? Um, so I'm wondering, like, do we, you know, are, are we using something that we would like to see, you know, like a county department inspect for and regulate and, like, is that something that we'd like them to do, or would we like there to be sort of a more voluntary process that has more, um, you know, yeah, it's more voluntary and it's more sort of just education based and it's not government oversight coming in to ensure certain criteria are met. Um, my guess is that if you know, if you were regulated by the government and the department, um, that would probably be a thing for producers to have to pay the, you know, 
affected. Yeah, well, as much as the EU is really high because the government will say we don't have the money to do it. So the only way they would do it is if they could justify it by, you know, being able to hire more staff and people to do it because they're getting the EU for inspections and food. These would probably be extraordinarily high and cost prohibitive. So our proposal right now doesn't say anything about you need to do these best practices or the act department is going to come and make sure that your growing safe or that you know come and test your soil or make sure that you're getting your soil tested it's you know pretty open like you can grow you can grow fresh fruits and vegetables in the yard um city zoning and planning can't stop you there might be extra legislation that um deals with the, the issues of this person um, but I think it will be for for traceability purposes. I, I don't anticipate. I'm just going to go by and get my experience and delve into some of those issues that you brought up. So I'm just wondering, you know, yeah, like, do we, we want to just prove it? Um, sorry, do we want to just allow um, more of this urban, more of these urban agriculture activities and trust that they're going to be on a small enough, you know, neighborhood or community-based basis that you can, you know, individuals can sort of be trusted to make their own judgments because they'll probably be buying from someone in their community that they may not know personally super well, but they may have some, you know, indirect personal relationship with. But do we think that there needs to be stricter standards to ensure these these practices? And, um, yeah, because I think we sort of all agree, like, we want, you know, we don't want to be reliant on the big industrial agriculture that is, you know, maybe, you know, got the green light from the USDA, but it's clearly not, you know, clearly not doing things that are, you know, healthy and safe for us and you know, not economically either. Um, but, like, what, you know, like, do we want to have some other government enforced standards for small scale urban agriculture, or do we want to have it be sort of more, you know, and in on personal relationships. Yeah, there's a self there's a self verification, there's a list of safe food handling practices, there's a list of check them all off on a list and sign at the bottom and the health department will do that on file. So so yeah, maybe it would be something like that. Also sounds kind of like that. Like yeah. you have to confirm certification that's essentially the self assessment. It's really long. <laughs> you can go through and you say, yeah, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, this is how we work. Mm-hmm. And, and, then then, and you get a certification. Yeah. I think the process will be potentially healthier and I think there could be I think as, as a farmer, a potential farmer in this, you want to have a market. You want to have um, you want to, you want people to trust you. You want to have credibility. And so if there's something I think in with in the policy or maybe it's just some whole other group needs to do that. Um, okay, I'm conveying the importance of buying from small localized yeah. enterprises. Because if we get a lot of people certified to do this, or allowed to do this, mm-hmm. and there's no market for it, well then we have a yeah. whole lot of weight. We have a whole lot of really good food that's brought in. Mm-hmm. Like, 
That's just going to be 10 on the table. 10 on the table. Yeah, I don't have to go through both um, houses to see a 10 yeah. in Or conference centers or facilities to have this event. 
And like a couple times I went there would be like lines like out the door and around the block of like, you know, people like consumers waiting to get in and consumers would pay like five dollars just to get in and then go around to the individual booths and um, spend money there and the New York Times wrote about it. Um, and so yeah, when they started they told the health department this is a private club and everyone attending is a member of this club and and you know, so we're not, you know, this is not a public event, so we don't need to be regulated by you. But at first the health department in San Francisco was like, okay, it's a private club. But then, you know, membership basically entailed like you writing your name and your email address on a sheet of paper and they sort of let people in without carefully monitoring whether they have even done that. And you know, it, 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 it seemed like the general public was kind of aware that this was going on and usually the that, um, so much reading from lost the entire organization did a lot of research on what constitutes a private club because we got really interested in this issue of like, well, when membership criteria, you see the private club, and like anyone public, people who are like, do this kind of thing professionally or interested in this kind of graphic. Or, yeah, or in your neighborhood, or yeah, so this was like clearly like not meeting the definition of a private club anymore by like any subjective interpretation, and so it's not really like super clear cut rules, but this is like, you know, tons of people coming, um, you know, it was like getting all this media attention, so finally they were getting, they got some pressure from the state, and the department shut it down, and some of the organizers were like facing some like fines and stuff for a while, I don't know what ended up coming to that, but underground market doesn't really happen anymore. Yeah. Um, or that specific one, there's still tons of underground restaurants and things like that that happen all the time, but that one just got too big. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it kind of, yeah, begs a lot of questions of like, like, what is, like, how far can you, how far can you push it in terms of like, this private cloud or like, a yeah, the, the issue is that a lot of these, a lot of these are like not very like clearly defined in the law. So the regulators have a good amount of discretion. Yeah. Yeah.